Hello, everybody. Welcome to another video of Finishing Value Podcast. This is another in-person interview. This is uh, in regards to the SBL conference at San Antonio, Texas, taking place from November the 18th to the 21st of 2023. And today I am interviewing in-person Professor Dennis McDonald. So thank you for joining me in person, Dennis. It's great to meet you. Oh, what a thrill it is to meet at last. Yes. Uh, we've been exchanging ideas for a couple of years now. And uh, we actually have developed a friendship. Um, and it's, it's so good to, uh, to share a hug earlier in the day. So that, uh, thank you for having me on again. Oh, thank you. So I want to get us right into a little misunderstanding that some people have had of your work, as I had uh, told you about a little earlier, but some think that you think that Paul didn't exist because of Acts reusing Homer, uh, the Homeric epics, and therefore they, for some reason, have fought to drag your views on Acts to Paul's letters and throughout the whole character. I can't imagine anything to be more foreign to my ideas. I did a dissertation on the reception of Paul. I've written articles on Paul. I'm a Pauline fan in many regards. Certainly, he was a real person. And I want to talk about Acts very briefly. Yeah. The author of the Acts of the Apostles actually knows a collection of Paul's letters that must have included at least Galatians and 1 Corinthians, in my view. It probably, he probably knows more. And he, so he gets many of his locations and names of the Pauline circles from combing through Paul's letters. But he's not s sufficiently happy with what Paul says. He's not interested so much in the Paul and the Jewish law, for example or taking on Judaizers. He's interested in making Paul a Christian philosopher. That's why uh, one of the first tasks he has is to be in Athens, uh, playing the role of a Socrates. He gives defenses of himself, very much like the Socratic Apologies. Um, and uh, I'm a big fan both of the Acts of the Apostles and Paul himself. But the, my point simply is that the depiction of Paul in the Acts of Paul is remarkably and importantly different from Paul himself. Mm. In fact, I think Paul would have been rather shocked to see that um, he's portrayed in the way that he ha has been by, uh, by Luke. But of course, he couldn't have read Luke uh, because of the difference in timing and so on. No, uh, I'm, I'm sure that there was a Paul. In fact, I think Paul is the most important witness that we have to the general uh, world of Jesus himself. And I say that because Paul is committed to something that the Q author has Jesus being concerned about, that is strict Torah observance and the hegemony of Mosaic law for Jewish life that can be enforced in ways that marginalize people. And for Paul, the big marginalization had to do with Gentiles because he felt called by Jesus, he, this is what he says, to open the fortunes of biblical Israel to Gentiles and a strict observance of Jewish law as interpreted later in the tradition um, would exclude Gentiles and eating, uh, 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 Gentiles and Jews eating with each other. And circumcision obviously became the primary uh, blocking of the Gentile mission for Paul. But Jesus himself in the Q document says, the law and the prophets were until John. After that, it's the kingdom of God. And uh, his, the, the Jesus and the Jesus of the Q document was Jewish, and his concern was to make Jewish law um, compatible and acceptable to marginalized people. You could say that he's a radical Hillelist mm. because Hillel, Rabbi Hillel, was also interested in relaxing Jewish law in order to not to avoid marginalizing people. And by the way, much of the Mishnah in the Talmud is carrying on that task 
to make Jewish law palatable to the marginal. And I put Jesus in that continuum, but I put Paul in that continuum too. Both of them are trying to challenge Jewish law to make it acceptable to the socially marginal. So what was Acts trying to do when, when the author of Acts was trying to remake Paul in light of Homer? I think that the Acts of Luke Acts itself, uh, as a, in, in general, is a rival to Virgil's Aeneid. Mm -hmm. um, Virgil's Aeneid is what I call a, mythos, a mythos of origins mm -hmm. uh, of the Roman Empire. And Luke is trying to write a muthos, that is a myth or legend or a, a narrative, of Christian origins. And to do so, he has a tag team that goes from John the Baptist to Jesus to Peter to Paul, and beyond Paul to the elders that uh, through the laying on of hands. And so he has a dynasty of um, Christian worthies, and he's trying to make Paul the philosopher uh, that Aeneas is not in the Aeneid. So that Christian origins have, have uh, philosophers, including Jesus, but also Paul, as a part of their history, whereas Virgil's Aeneid does not. You simply have a warrior. Mm. So Acts wants to make Paul, for a competitive reason, better than the heroes that he finds in the Aeneid. And in Homer's epics, etc. Yes, and you can see how that works because um, he often imitates Homeric epics that are the same ones that Virgil had imitated over a century earlier, and that cannot by, be by accident. So he is trying to what the Greeks call uh, zelosis. He's trying to rival his rival imitator of Homer so that uh, Jesus and Paul and Peter, to some extent, are more worthy than Aeneas, but also, of course, the Homeric heroes of Achilles and, um, and Odysseus and so on. Mm -hmm. And what else is Acts trying to do when, with the way it portrays Paul and Jesus together? At the post-resurrected the post Jesus appears to Paul and says, stop persecuting me. So it's, it seems to be trying to embellish the relationship between Paul and Jesus. Can you talk about that? Well, of course. Um, Paul then is one of the people who gets a special revelation of the, the risen Jesus. But the passage you're talking about, Jacob, is actually an imitation of Euripides' Bacchae. Mm. In the Bacchae, King Pentheus is given a chance to repent of his persecution of the followers of Dionysus, especially the female followers. And um, he, Pentheus refuses to do so um, and then is killed, whereas Paul has a vision of um, the risen Christ. And by the way, he quotes the Bacchae in the Acts of the Apostles. It's hard for you to kick against the boons. Mm -hmm. And Paul is struck uh, blind for a short time. He converts, and then he becomes a Dionysian character himself. He has a, a miraculous prison break that's very similar to the one that you have in Dionysus. And by the way, I'm not by any means the first person to have seen those connections with the Bacchae. Uh, serious scholars of the Acts of the Apostles routinely talk about those parallels. So what you have in the calling of or the conversion of Paul in the Acts of Paul um, it does have echoes in the Pauline epistles itself, but is um, glorified as an imitation of what one finds in the Bacchae. So in this case, Paul is a contrast with King Pentheus, who mm. dies because he does not convert, um, and he does kick against the goads, Paul stops kicking against the goads, and for that reason, um, it becomes a, an ambassador for opening the fortunes of Israel to Gentiles. And so, when it comes to the we passages, and you and I have talked about the we passages in Acts before in prior interviews, um, 
why does Acts create the we passages? And and I know that I know that you go into the detail about Homer's Odyssey, I think it was, that also makes that sudden switch from first to third person or, or third person to first person like Acts does. But why did Acts feel why did the author of Acts feel it was necessary to do that himself? Um, we know from Luke himself that when he wrote the gospel, he was using several, he uses the word many different mm -hmm. documents that had uh, talked about Jesus. But when he gets to the Acts of the Apostles, he does not have narratives about what happened after uh, Jesus's death and appearances. So um, he uses um, the Petrine section, which is all in the third person omniscient, um, as a way of describing what happened, because uh, Peter himself would have known uh, Jesus. You have John Mark, who plays a role at that point as, as well. But when one gets to Paul, there are no explicit references to previous documents. Mm -hmm. Though I mentioned that uh, the author knows a collection of Paul's epistles. So he uses a trope that appears in historical writings, but also appears in poetry of the first person participatory um, uh, person uh, narrative, where he talks about, we did this, we did that. Now, scholars variously understand that as a way of inviting the reader to identify with the Pauline mission. We experience this. This is a part of our tradition and so on. But I think it really is a tip off that you're to understand Paul's adventures to be similar to the adventures of Odysseus. But also in the uh, Aeneid, there's a, a long, almost entire book of the Aeneid that's in the first person plural. Um, or, or, and also the first person singular where Aeneas is ta talking about his adventures that are Odyssean uh, in a way, at least Homeric in a way, um, to Dido. So mm -hmm. he said, we, we set out from Troy, we had this uh, happen, we had a shipwreck and so on. And so that gets picked up in Paul um, as a part of his imitation of, of the classical tradition. So the idea of having this we is a part of the narrative tr tradition of epic. And for Paul, I would say uh, his Luke Acts is a prose epic. Mm -hmm. And when Acts uses Papias, because you, you mentioned that, um, and, we've, and we've talked about this before as well, that Luke Acts, um, in your view, knows Papias. And it talks about... Um, the exploding Judas, for instance. Right. Did, do you think Papias may have gotten this information from an earlier source, or do you think Papias himself created that material that Luke Acts used? That's a, a very good question. And Papias himself answers the question. Mm. He thinks that um, it's important to trust living voices, that is, traditions um, that are related to the elders and to indirectly then to the apostles themselves. Um, and so twice in the narrative about Judas, he uses the word fasi. Fasi means they say. And I think this is an indication of his awareness of criticisms of the Gospel of Matthew depicting Jesus's death as a suicide, mm -hmm. which then is a kind of a vindication of him. And they, the tradition apparently says, and I think we can know, by the way, who the who that they are, mm -hmm. but, um, but they didn't like Matthew's depiction and they wanted to be divine judgment instead. And that's why his guts pour out and so on. And Luke picks that up. But the Fosse probably is a ref reference to traditions related to the elders um, that he introduces in his prologue. He says he's collecting materials and he, um, from the people who knew Christian origins. Mm 
And it's likely that they're the ones who are the fussy, the they say, mm. who are um, not happy with Matthew, and that Papias is the one who then glorifies it and writes it down in his elegant way. So I think we've uh, covered uh, Luke X there pretty well, and I'd like to uh, move uh, move on to Q. Sure. So you look at Q and you see parallels between Homer's Odyssey and Q. We talked a little bit about that too in the past, but for those that are unfamiliar, can you delve into that for a bit? Well, I, I don't know that it would be helpful to begin with okay. a, a possible Homeric allusions in the Q document because there's so much controversy about what Q looks like in any case. My Q, I don't like calling Q. I call it Q plus or by its own title, the Logoi, that is the discourses of Jesus. And the problems with um, reconstructing Q in the past are twofold, and both of them are problematic. And then there's a third uh, issue. One issue is mark new Q. There are too many doublets and non-doublets and what can, one can call mimetic doublets, where Mark is echoing a document that is very similar to what one finds, let's say, in Matthew's special material. So you can't ignore Mark as a potential witness to the Q document. And in fact, there's a, a subgroup of people who have been with the International Q Project who hold to the modified uh, Q document, two-source hypothesis, um, namely that Mark cannot be ignored as a potential witness to Q. The other is the legitimate criticism of the Farah hypothesis people, such as Mark Goodacre, that Luke had to have known Matthew, and in fact, he surely knows Matthew. So the question then that is posed to the Q, traditional Q people, if Luke knows Matthew, mm -hmm. you've got a problem. If Mark extensively knows Q, you've got a problem. Now, is there a way to get around those problems? And another piece of it is, that Mark, yes, knows Q, but he also is heavy in Homeric imitation, so that you have to factor in the Homeric mimesis in the Gospel of Mark before you can tease out more of the influence of um, the Q document. And I'll give you one example. All reconstructions of Q, legitimately and rightly, have the expression, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That precise wording appears in the triumphal entry in the Gospel of Mark, but it's in the context of an imitation of Homer where Odysseus is going for the first time into the city of the Theachians. And um, the, the parallels are really quite striking. So here you have a Q saying embedded inside a Homeric imitation in Mark, and it appears as a doublet in both Matthew and Luke because they see it both in the triumphal entry and they see it uh, in the Q document. Now, this is just one example of dozens. I have a book coming out um, that's coming out soon, which is a companion to my synopsis of the Epic Tragedy and the Gospels. And this book is called Must the Synoptics Remain a Problem? Mm -hmm. So it's an answer to the synoptic problem. And my answer to that title is it need not be any longer a problem. And um, I think the Q plus Papias hypothesis has got to get traction and attention as a plausible, and in my view, the most successful interpretation of the Q hypothesis, the, the two source hypothesis, and the existence of the lost gospel. Furthermore, this document, as uh, the, that proposal, includes a reconstruction of the Q document that makes it a whole document. It's not a collection of sayings, it's an imitation of Deuteronomy to make Jesus the promised prophet like Moses. 
and one can see uh, allusions, quotations, um, transformations of Deuteronomy. And there are echoes of the Odyssey, not in order to impress anybody, but simply to um, make Jesus an Odyssean-like suffering character who in the end is victorious. So um, uh, I'm really excited about this book, and I hope that I can have it out by the beginning of the year. We're at the point now of doing the indices and some marketing. Can you explain the criteria of reverse priority? So that um, in the sense that, okay, so Luke knows Matthew, he knows Mark, Matthew knows Mark too. They all use Q. So how does one tell when Matthew is more primitive and when Luke is more primitive? Oh, primitive? that's a very good question. And um, I, I hope I can get these uh, materials, the, these three criteria in the right order. One is, um, is a saying uh, isolated or is it embedded in a narrative? And almost always a saying that is independent, like the saying I mentioned before, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, is more primitive than one that is embedded in a narrative. So that the that if something stand, stands alone, it's more primitive than in a narrative. Another example is, um, is it a typicality or an, um, an atypicality? That is, we know how the authors of the Gospels wrote. We know what their vocabulary and grammars were. And uh, we know that they had certain commitments to who Jesus was. So if we've got two, we're comparing, comparing two sayings, let's say, um, comparing a Matthew and Luke, we know what their commitments are theologically or linguistically. If we find in one of them something that is so typically Matthean or so typically Lucan, we're going to say that probably is secondary. So the one that doesn't show a typicality is, um, is closer. So we'll give you an example. Luke has, uh, for the so-called Lord's Prayer, which is actually the Disciples' Prayer, um, uh, our Father. Matthew has our Father who is in heaven. That is an expression that it just is a giveaway. That or um, and you find Matthew talking about the kingdom of heaven and Luke having the kingdom of God. Well, Matthew is interested in the kingdom of heaven all over the place. That's in fact it appears in his redactions of Mark. So um, if you find a typicality, you dismiss it in favor of an atypicality, something that is not typical of the those gospels. The third criterion is actually the most important. And that is if you find uh, in comparing two sayings that one has a problem and another is missing the problem, it's likely that the one that's missing the problem is later because he's trying to, um, to repair the damage. So the this criterion I, I think of in terms of a, a difficulty is earlier than an improvement. And so you, you might have something that's embarrassing about Jesus, let's say, in one gospel. And in the next gospel, it's improved. Jesus is not the jerk that he was in the previous gospel. The tradition is going to move in the direction of improvement, almost always, not always but almost always it's in the direction of improvement. So those are the three most important criteria. The, is a saying isolated or is it embedded in a narrative? Is it atypical or is it typical? If it's atypical, it's more likely uh, or original. Does it have a problem that it, and it, that's more likely to be origin, more original than one that is um, has has papered over the problem. Mm. And when it's all said and done and the text is uh, reconstructed 
and you get to the you, we get to your reconstruction. Do you have a criteria of being able to tell which of the of them of the bunch of verses is authentic to the historical Jesus and which ones are not? I try not to say anything about the historical Jesus in terms of things that he actually said or did. Mm. That's not to say that the Q document isn't invaluable for understanding who the historical Jesus was, because it's our earliest narrative about him. It squares with some of the things that we find in Josephus about John the Baptist and Jesus, not the Testimonium Flavianum, but uh, the the other other pieces that one can put together. And it also, uh, we talked about this earlier, the, the issue on Jewish law is similar in Paul as it is in the document, the Q document. So the way that I like to see it, that I like to talk about it, is that the Q document is a glorification of the historical Jesus. But it's a glorification that is consistent with Judaism and is not um, uh, tainted by Greek mythology. And so what we can get from the Q document is Jesus' social location inside of Palestinian Judaism. And it can explain why he was executed. Namely, he was a Jewish troublemaker for challenging the Pharisees and other Torah enforcers who had a strict interpretation of the law. And therefore, Jesus became charismatic, apparently, among Jews who liked that way of being Jewish better than the, uh, the high-handed hegemony of um, the Torah enforcers. So um, we have a similar thing going on with John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist was executed because he was too popular among the, 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 uh, the populace, and probably because he was offering an alternative way of um, salvation. That is, you didn't have to give sacrifices at the temple. You could repent and be baptized um, for, uh, for purity and so on. Not too different from what we might find at Qumran, for example. So when you say that Jesus wanted to relax the extreme uh, Torah enforcer viewpoint, how was he trying to achieve this? Um, he, there's a, an amazing passage that is so badly understood by scholars, and I'm glad that you brought it up, and I'll give you then another example of how it applies. He said, those who obey even the least of the Mosaic commandments will be called great in the kingdom of God. So he is not against those who can uh, have the, the ability to observe all the commandments, the mitzvot, if you wish. And those who do not observe all of the commandments will be called least in the kingdom of God. But here's the kicker. Both are in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Those who observe all the commandments are called great. There are others who are in the kingdom of God who can't or don't observe all of them, and they're going to be called least, but they're in the kingdom of God. So later on in um, the Q document, there's an alternative to what we, one finds in Deuteronomy, but also Leviticus, um, the Mosaic or divine command that you must obey all of the commandments that I command to you today. And if you obey them all, you will live. And this is now the Septuagint I'm, I'm talking about, in that version, the Greek version. Jesus is talking to an expert on Jewish law. And the issue is, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus then says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, do this and you shall live. That is, it's a minimal understanding of law. It has to do with fidelity to the Jewish God, and it also has to do with love your neighbor as yourself. It's a law of compassion. So the idea uh, for the author is 
That's all you need to be in the kingdom of God is to have the love commandment. Now, you'll be called least in the kingdom of God. And those who can obey all the commandments are going to be called the greatest in the kingdom of God. But you don't need to do all of that in order to be in this new kingdom of God that no longer is um, beholden in the same way to Jewish law and the prophets. And this, of course, upset the, the Pharisees, the hardliners, the extreme Torah enforcers, and that's why they pretty much wanted him out of the way. Uh, I'm going to um, modify what you said just okay. a little bit. I'm not talking about the historical Jesus. I want to talk about the author's understanding of Jesus. Okay. And, and I'll tell you why. After Jesus gives woes against the Pharisees and other Torah enforcers, he turns to his disciples and he said, um, don't eat the yeast of the Pharisees. And don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but can't kill the soul. Now, the reader is going to assume that those who have the authority to kill the body are going to be the Torah enforcers that he just um, uh, abused. I mean, he, he, he you know, reamed them out. So, um, but we don't know that Pharisees in Galilee ever executed anybody for Torah uh, avoidance. Um, maybe they did, but we don't know about them. Um, so it's almost paranoid uh, for the author to say, um, you know, you might be held accountable in synagogues and they may kill you. So I think it's hyperbolic even for the author to say, um, you know, you're going to have hardships, but don't let it bother you because there'll be a tribunal in heaven. And if you're faithful to the Son of Man, the Son of Man will defend you before the angels of God and so on. That's how it works. Um so I don't, I don't think that the author of the Q document is giving us um, a video of Jesus himself. I think what we have here is a highly perspectival and alienated understanding of um, Judaism in Galilee. And he makes Jesus the hero of a laxer way of, of being Jewish. So I want to come back to the uh, Luke knowing Matthew. In the traditional uh, point of view, they say that Matthew and Luke are independent of one another in copying Mark. What if you can get into the problems that exist with that from your point of view? I mean, how do I how should I put it? Okay. If Luke knows Matthew, but the three still know Q, how does that help us understand Q better in light of Luke knowing Matthew? Well, it reminds it requires new criteria for mm -hmm. determining. Um, in what way parallels between Matthew and Luke can be understood as um, Matthew's more primitive piece, which everybody's going to acknowledge, uh, certainly I would, and sometimes, but many times, Luke is more primitive. Now, this is where this reverse priority we talked about comes in. So you compare Matthew and Luke, and you find in many cases, Luke is more primitive than what you find in Matthew. And this is a total embarrassment to the far hypothesis people, because they want to say well, the parallels between Matthew and Luke, well, it just means Luke is borrowing from Matthew. Damn it, that's not the case. There are many examples where that's not the case. And advocates of that position frequently have to go to a crazy length to explain how Luke could have derived what he has um, from Matthew. No, he's getting it from somewhere else. And this now is being um, um, confirmed by um, artificial intelligence, a data uh, um, that is showing that uh, Luke often is more primitive than Matthew and um, in the reconstruction of Q. Um, 
so so yes luke knows matthew but he's got to know something else and it gives plausibility that the places where in fact he's dependent on matthew or q that matthew is is also uh, dependent on q it becomes more tricky when you have as you can see why um a uh, doublets in matthew where you have the saying that is shared with luke but you have the same saying in math in mark and matthew is redacting both mark and the lost gospel and how do you determine then which of those two is earlier and in that case almost always in fact i would say always mark is secondary to what one finds in matthew and i can give you a number of examples but that becomes a little too esoteric perhaps but um so th this is why the synoptic problem has been so difficult to understand so i'm going to give you the two keys to solving the synoptic problem and this is the core of my book must the synoptics remain a problem the first key is this mark knows q and you have to then be sensitive to echoes of q throughout mark it's not just the doublets and the non-doublets that people have talked about there are scores of echoes of the q document in mark if we're sensitive to look for them the second is to understand that mark and luke in particular are dependent on the homeric epics so mark's way of rewriting q often is to create a narrative around the saying that has a parallel in the homeric epics and this, the example i gave of the triumphal entry is a beautiful one but it's not the only one by any means so that you have to unlock saying by saying parable by parable the notion that maybe mark is still being influenced by the q document that's the first key the second key is to take a look at what mark has done with the, that saying and uh, see if it has a homeric background and uh, once you, you uh, apply both keys you find amazing uh, material um, and it allows one then to reconstruct more of Q than we usually have. But you need both keys. Uh, I've told people th that the synoptic problem is like a jigsaw puzzle that is missing a lot of pieces. And let's say that it's missing half of the pieces. So you can move those tiles around the board trying to reconstruct the picture. You don't have a box that has the picture of the, of, of the image. So uh, you can move these pieces around endlessly. What you need is more, pick, more tiles, and you have to have a bigger picture. And Homeric epics can supply more of the pieces so the and more of the images so that it allows us to um, reconstruct the synoptic problem um, in a much more sophisticated manner what persuaded you that luke knew matthew can you tell us a bit about that um, so I would say probably the infancy narratives are the best example. Now, people want to say that um, Matthew's infancy narrative is so different from Luke's that um, they just have to come out of what they call different tradition, independent tradition. No, there are all kinds of verbal similarities and sequential similarities between Luke's account and what one finds in Matthew. The issue of the uh, virginal conception, for example, is, is one example. Another is the, the Annunciation, which is to Joseph in Matthew, but it's into Zechariah and Mary and so on. Um, one of the things that Luke is interested in doing is adding the birth of John the, uh, John the Baptist. 
so that he has a reason to expand Matthew's account. But also, and this is really fascinating, he uses the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite to, uh, as his version of the Annunciations to Zechariah and Mary. And you can line the two texts up um, verbally. It's amazing. So Luke has Matthew, but he also has the um, Homeric hymn to Aphrodite. Now, Jacob, why is it that Luke is interested in the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite? It's because it's about the birth of Aeneas. So right from the beginning, Luke acts is interested in the Roman Aeneas. And Virgil uses the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite to, uh, and its promise that there will be an eternal dynasty uh, founded by Aeneas. And Jesus is the, the alternative to that. So that you can, by putting Matthew together with the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, you get much of the Luke and infancy story. Um, so that's why it's so different, because Luke has a different uh, task in writing the infancy story. Matthew's not interested in Aeneas. Luke is interested in Aeneas because he's going to rival the Aeneid. And what would, what would you say is the best criteria to utilize when sifting through the data that we have? try to best understand and reconstruct as much as we can about the historical Jesus? Um, I think the, the, the best we can do, Jacob, in my view, is to say, take seriously overlapping sayings and positioning of Jewish law in the Q document, in Papius, I mean, in uh, Josephus, and in Paul. That's why earlier on we talked about the importance of Paul. All of them identify the early Jesus movement as not a threat to Rome. No, no, no. It's not that the uh, the Jesus movement is uh, holding Jesus to be the Messiah. No, no, no. I mean, even though Paul knows of Jesus as the Christ, the Jewish Christ, but that's not what's going on. What's going on is a challenge to Torah obedience in Galilee that is marginalizing people. And that's one of the reasons Paul is charismatic, because he's opening up the biblical fortunes of Israel to Gentiles. And so th th that's being welcomed by God fearers and so on. The same thing's true of um, uh, Jesus's brother uh, James or Jacob um, and the other followers. They are Torah observant, but not as Torah observant as some would like. And for that reason, they were killed. And we have fears in the Q document that uh, by challenging the Pharisees, um, Jesus' followers may, um, may be killed by synagogue trials. And I think that's an exaggeration. I don't think it happened, but I think it's paranoid. But it tells us a lot about the historical Jesus, that the historical Jesus probably was a charismatic teacher and one of probably several, maybe 12, right, um, advocates for a new understanding of Judaism that could be more inclusive and more compassionate than uh, would be the case with uh, the uh, more stringent uh, Torah observers. So after Jesus was crucified about around circa 30 CE and later on it seems like James's brother is succeeding him in the church, is James continuing the same struggles that Jesus did? And, that, and that's why when the high priest in Annas in 62 CE ordered the death of James, as Josephus tells us about, that it was because Ananus accused James of apparently violating the law. Um, yes, but in the same passage, Jacob, mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up. In, in the same passage, um, Josephus says that others who were more expert in the law 
said Ananus was out of line and should not have killed them. Now, the reason I put it that way is Jacob or James and the others were Torah observant in the viewpoint, in the, in the perspective of some. Now, whether they're Hillelites or whatever, but he says that they are more lenient, what we call, would call more liberal in their understanding of law. And they told Ananus that he couldn't kill people anymore. But Ananus thought they were not sufficiently Torah observant, and therefore he thought he could kill them. Hmm. Now, one of the things that's fascinating is you have in the Q document, in my view, Jesus saying he would destroy the temple and build another in three days, or build another that was not made with hands, not in three days, that's Mark. But... Um, if that's a part of the proclamation that people attributed to Jesus, and Mark says it's on the lips of false witnesses, but surely there's something in the tradition that said that Jesus said he would destroy the temple. Um, that gets you in trouble. And what is Ananus? He's a chief priest, and he's responsible for temple management. So anything that's going to be challenging to the the um, to the temple is going to be in trouble. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't violate the temple. So um, those who knew the law would would say, you know, this is really not a part of the, the legal dispute. Um, but Ananas thought it must have been that um, they're, they're, they're at least violating uh, Jewish uh, custom. And I'd like to shift back to Luke in, in my closing question. Um, when you look at the Lord's Gospel, or Marcion's Evangelion, and I know that in your book you take the view that the Evangelion is utilizing Luke's Gospel and not vice versa. What is being changed about Luke? What's being condensed? Why, why is his text being created to modify Luke? What's going on? Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question to make sure I understand sure. it. If it's the case that Marcion's gospel is a redaction of the canonical Luke, mm -hmm. what was the problem of canonical Luke for that for for the person who truncated it? Yes, that's my question. I think it's whether Marcion did it himself or not, I think it's clear that that, and, and by the way, what I'm going to say is not perfectly consistent with every all the data, but I think it's largely consistent. Anything that firmly linked Jesus to Judaism was a problem. That's why you don't have Luke's infancy narrative at all, because Luke's infancy narrative is hooking the, Jesus' life into the, the biblical tradition, the, the Jewish tradition. So that's gone. You have other places where there is reference to law and prophets, which is gone. Where it ref references to Moses and Mosaic law, gone. And it really is not entirely consistent, but it's it it's amazing how much of that kind of material is is gone. So um, we know that Marcion thought that the God of Jesus was not the God of Jewish scriptures. And whether he was the first person to have done this and he himself purged um, Luke of this, um, or he inherited it, from someone else, that person, if it's someone else, had Marcionite proclivities. He, they wanted to portray Jesus as having a God who's different from the God of Israel. And um, again, I could go through more examples, but I think the absence of the infancy narrative really should just be shouting out that the author is trying to distance Jesus from 
um, the, the God of Jesus from the God of Israel. Well, thank you for joining me today, Dennis McDonald. Uh, my pleasure, Jacob. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.